Fernando Alonso couldn't quite get that elusive first win of the season, but even so, coming home in P2 with his best result of the season so far, and only behind Max Verstappen in the dominant RB19, is nothing to scoff at. And now this race could have been even more special for Alonso and Aston Martin, in terms of if they lost the win by putting him on the mediums instead of the inters on lap 55, in my opinion, the answer is absolutely yes. Now, very roughly, the time lost during a pit stop is just under 20 seconds. On lap 55, at the point where Fernando left the pits, having just put on the medium tyres, you can see on this screenshot with him coming out of the pits that he is just under 26 seconds behind Max, meaning he would have needed to roughly make up about 6 or so seconds on the inters to be able to jump him. And now, lap 55 was the crossover lap where the inters would have been the faster tyre. Keep in mind, on this lap we had Sainz locking up and spinning out a Mirabeau, and although this wasn't caught on the live feed, we even had Max almost crashing out when he made contact with the barriers at Portier. Courtesy of my good friend Brake over on Twitter, we can see that Max's last lap on the slicks on lap 55 which included that little collision at Portier and also coming into the pits was a 2 minute 10 second 0.6. If we take a look at Yuki Tsunoda, who was a lap down and pitted right in front of Alonso, but did fit the inter tyre, on his lap 54, which included him leaving the pits, and which would have been lap 55 for Max, he did a 1 minute 41 second 0.0. You've got to think that Alonso on the Inters would have been able to get at least close to that lap time, and if he did, he would have had a great chance of jumping Max. All of this, of course, is massive hindsight, because at that exact moment when Aston Martin decided to pit, and the mechanics picked up his tyres, the dry tyre was still technically the faster tyre at that exact moment over a lap. Aston Martin by no means bottled it or anything like that. Keep in mind, even though Alonso had the gap behind him, he still had everything to lose running in P2 and, for a team which has only just started to score consistent podiums, it's very difficult to start gambling when you're about to have your best result of the season anyway. Even though Fernando and Aston Martin had a great day finishing in P2 and scoring 18 points, or whilst it might not seem like it because they didn't bring home any silverware, mathematically Mercedes had an even better one. With Lewis in P4 having taken the fastest lap, and George in P5, Mercedes come away from the weekend with 23 points. What that means after 6 races is that, whilst Aston Martin are still second in the Constructors' Championship on 120 points, Mercedes are now just one point behind them in third on 119. I think Mercedes, for all of their shortcomings and once again, they have under-delivered in terms of their car in 2023, but just putting that to one side, this is still a championship caliber team with the two championship caliber drivers and championship DNA throughout all of their personnel from the pit wall to the management, but just operating in the midfield because that's where their car has confined their drivers to. There's no doubt that the Aston Martin is a better car, it's strong in both qualifying and the race, which is why it's better than both the Mercedes and Ferrari, and it's just so consistent from track to track in the hands of Alonso. The Mercedes has been a nightmare in qualifying for some reason, but in the race, on the right track and in the right conditions, it can kind of almost match the Aston Martin. The problem for Mercedes is that by the time you qualify badly and are already on the back foot, you're basically not going to catch Alonso unless there's a safety car, or unless he makes a mistake. And when was the last time you remember Alonso making a mistake? And yet, despite all of that, Mercedes are just one point behind Aston Martin in the championship. Now, it doesn't take a genius to realise that this is because, so far Aston Martin has basically run a one-car team. But just how bad has Stroll's contribution really been compared to the other drivers around him. Well, in terms of the percentage of points that the trailing driver has contributed relative to their teammate, Sergio Perez, who finished the Monaco Grand Prix out of the points, so far has scored 42.2% of Red Bull's total points. 
So even though he's just come off the back of a shocking result, he has still been a very strong contributor. George Russell, who has more than backed up Lewis Hamilton, and despite a reliability DNF in Australia, has scored 42% of Mercedes' total points. At Ferrari, despite two DNFs so far, I think Leclerc is more unlucky than anything else to be behind Sainz, but even then, Leclerc has scored 46.7% of Ferrari's points. Even looking a little bit further down, despite the fact that his teammate has just scored a podium, which points-wise has an even bigger effect in the midfield, Pierre Gasly has still scored 40% of the team's total points. When it comes to Aston Martin, Lance Stroll has only scored 22.5% of Aston Martin's total points. Now, yes he's had one reliability related DNF in Jeddah, but like I said, so has Russell and so has Leclerc, so that isn't a reason or an excuse to be that far behind. And now recently you might have seen a video that I did of my top 5 best and worst drivers after the first 5 races of the season. Now, in that video, I included Stroll as one of my five worst so far, and it's fair to say reading the comments that I got a little bit of heat for that take. Quite a few people said that I was being overly harsh on Stroll, but I stand by what I said, and honestly, I don't think that I was being harsh. I was just now judging him by the same standards that I would judge the drivers that he should be around, given the cars that he's driving. I mean, could you imagine if... Sir Lewis Hamilton would be down in 8th in the championship, with his teammate in 3rd or 4th. Let's be brutally honest here, he would be getting absolutely slated. Up against Seb, I think Lance did a very respectable job because the level that they were competing at with the cars that they were given was the level where Stroll could perform well at. However, with all due respect to Seb, even though he was still driving very well, Fernando has just come into the team and it's pretty obvious even just using Stroll as a reference and taking into account that the car has gotten better, Alonso is just driving in a different league to what the team has had in the past. In qualifying in 2021, according to the race, the average gap between Stroll and Vettel was just under a tenth. In 2022, the average gap was just over a tenth. So far, after six races, Alonso has not only whitewashed Stroll in qualifying, but he has also been on average over three tenths quicker than Lance. In the races, Alonso has been Alonso. Five podiums in six races, with three front row starts as well in the second best car on the grid. That's the definition of doing your job. What's quite interesting is that coming into the season, Lance was obviously compromised due to breaking both of his wrists, and the expectation was that he was going to start off on the back foot, understandably, and just get closer and closer to Alonso. But the injury has turned out to be a non-factor because the opposite has happened. The longer Alonso's been in the car, the more he has stretched out the gap to Stroll. In qualifying, Stroll has been knocked out in Q1 in Miami, which Lance said was because they risked not putting on a new set of tires to get into Q2, and then he also got knocked out of Q2 in Monaco because of a mistake on his final run and also because according to the team he picked up some damage from Norris. Now, even if you take all of that at face value and apportion absolutely no blame to Stroll, he then didn't exactly shine in the races. Monaco was always going to be difficult, obviously, but even that doesn't then excuse him from hitting pretty much every single barrier on the track and just generally having a scruffy race. And then even in Miami, a track where you could overtake, he wasn't exactly able to get to the points, finishing in P12. And I guess my only question would be, if you put Alonso, who actually qualified second in that race, in 18th, I am guessing that in that car, he would have still found a way to score points. Having said all of that, I think what's strange about this situation is that it's actually sort of, kind of, not really Lance's fault. He has been artificially put into a team by his dad that he's just not good enough for. And that's less the fault of him 
and more the fault of his dad who chose to put him in and kept him in a position that he just isn't good enough to succeed at. Currently Lawrence Stroll is riding high because the team is on the up and also because he's got Fernando Alonso driving out of his skin. But that doesn't take away from the fact that he knowingly has a driver in the other car that he purposely chose to put there that is under delivering and holding them back. In real Formula 1 where your dad doesn't buy a Formula 1 team for you, if you're good enough in a midfield car then you're gonna stay and you're gonna grow with your team as they get better because your performances will match the equipment that you're given. If the team then gives you a better car and you can't raise your performance levels, then the team will drop you and get a better driver for that level of car because it's all about maximizing what you're given and maybe even over delivering if you've got two top quality drivers up against a weaker driver pairing in comparable cars. If Aston Martin was Alpine or McLaren, Lance Stroll would have been gone. Lance is not an incompetent driver who doesn't even deserve to be in Formula 1. He is not a Latifi, but he hasn't earned or proved that he's good enough to deliver in the second or even the third best car over a season up against the absolute best on the grid. In 2020, the Racing Point was undoubtedly the third best car on the grid, and whilst his teammate Checo finished fourth in the championship, meaning he actually outperformed and beat another Red Bull, Lance, despite having some amazing highlights, only finished down in 11th in the championship. What we've seen is not an anomaly season for Lance, it's just the level that he's been driving at since at least 2020. And now, I am not mad that Lance Stroll is at Aston Martin because I get why he's there and to be honest, it doesn't really keep me up at night. But I am not going to take Lawrence Stroll seriously about how Aston Martin will be the next coming of Mercedes if he is literally putting a cap on his team's potential with a driver who isn't good enough just because he's his son, despite the overwhelming amount of evidence. Lance Stroll still has an entire season to prove me wrong by the way, and if by the summer break he climbs to 6th, 5th or even 4th in the championship, then I will come on my channel and give the guy his props for delivering at the level that he should. I am not looking for one good result or even one podium for people to come back to this video and say, there you go, he's proved that he can do it. I am looking for consistent results within the top 5 that will move him up in the championship and also help solidify Aston Martin in the constructors. I am more than happy to be proven wrong, but until then, Lance Stroll is going to continue to cap the team's potential and potentially cost them second in the constructors if he doesn't improve. And so far throughout his career, there just hasn't been any evidence to say that he actually will. Well, there you have it. I hope you did enjoy this video. If you want to support the channel, then don't forget to subscribe. That would be massively appreciated. And I'll see you in the next one.